Hello and welcome to What's Doing, your gateway to the minds which are shaping the world of entertainment and media in Malaysia. I am your host Abid and today we have the pleasure of speaking with a true trailblazer in the Malaysian creative industry, Mr. Zainir Aminullah. Zainir is the CEO of Revolution Media which has been a pivotal force in evolving the landscape of Malaysian media. From his pioneering days at Astro to venturing into his own content company, Revolution Media, Zainir has consistently pushed the boundaries of creative content for local audiences and also internationally. Today, we are set to explore more into Zainir's journey, his insights into content creation, his successes with projects like Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency and The Ghost Bride for Netflix, and his vision for the future of media. Welcome, Zainir, from What's Doing. A disclaimer for all our listeners and viewers that Zainir was my boss for six years at Astro, and he was more of a friend than a boss, and uh, he was always been a mentor to me. So it's a great honor for me to have you on What's Doing. Thank you so much for taking time out and coming on to the show. Always a pleasure talking to you, Abhi. So uh, let's start off from the very beginning. I mean, Zainir, you have... you. You have been in oil and gas, for God's sake. And then you made a move to media. How was that transition? How was that journey? I means what made you go from an engineering side to, to a creative side? Well, some would argue that media is also a bit like selling oil. Um, <laughs> I was an engineer by training. So um, I worked for an oil and gas company for a while. But very quickly, I moved on to do marketing and general operations. So I did not stay to practice my engineering skills um, and I think at that time the opportunity was uh, irresistible because you know Astro was launching in 1996 uh, brand new company brand new service brand new technology and it was just too exciting for me to uh, say no to um, and the transition to Astro was um, not entirely that difficult because I was essentially coming from a marketing and operation background my first job at Astro was uh, sales. I was basically uh, doing commercial sales, so selling Astro to pubs and restaurants and hotels and hospitals. Uh, that was my job. Um, and I did that for a while before I moved on to uh, marketing. And then only later that I was, uh, uh, I joined content. So you did your whole nine yards of, you know, getting to that content space rather than just walking in from from an oil, uh, oil and gas uh, industry and uh, yeah yeah so i think that was the transition from doing engineering because that's what i studied for three years okay fine done done that um, but the years in sales marketing both uh, in the previous company and astro uh, really prepared me for my job and my responsibility at content because that uh, gave me a very strong perspective of the consumer uh, and I had a very strong consumer uh, POV whenever you know we looked at a content strategy. So taking that uh, from 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 the strategy part of it, uh, reflecting on your time at Astro, you know, what was the key strategies did you implement uh, in content creation for the new Malay language channels? Um, what I said earlier uh, is really a, a, a marketing mindset. It's really a, a, a viewer mindset. It's really a consumer mindset. Um, when I was made responsible for content, the brief was very simple. The brief was back then, at that point in time, Astro was very strong with two consumer segments, the English speaking urban households. Um, because we had HBO and um, uh, English Premier League, all this urban content. And then uh, the Chinese segment, because we had, you know, Wild Toy and the plethora of Chinese channels. So the brief to me was, we need to get the Malay subscribers, because that's basically the pyramid, you know, fattens with that segment. We need to make sure that they come in, right? So to do, to, to, to give an answer to that brief or to that question, you really have to understand whom you are making the content for. And I think um, I struggled and we struggled um, a lot understanding who were, who we were making content for. And, you know, uh, we always get, you know, in a discussion with various parties, including agencies and research people and so on, you always get to try and define who is this viewer, who is this consumer. And 
Um, normally, you go with certain demographics, you know, whatever, 15 to 29 and male versus female, urban versus house, urban versus uh, rural. And I always find that that's not very, um, not just inaccurate, but uh, very lazy because you should be making um, your product or offering your product or making a contact for one person. So I think earlier on, uh, when I took the job, I would always get into a discussion of who, describe to me who this person is. Mm. So, uh, okay, 15 to 30, so 25 to 39. Who is that person? Is it more 35 or 31? Because that's two different stages. 35, you got your middle, uh, middle uh, midlife crisis to some people. 31, you're still, you know, busy with your toddler, right? So try and describe that one person uh, and try and be accurate. She's a 35-year-old housewife. She's living in Ampang. She came from Kelantan. And she's now doing this and she's now doing that. Her kids go to Sekolah Menengah Kebangsaan. Be precise because once you're precise, then you can actually form a core circle and then from there you expand. So you have like, you, you can easily say that, okay, this person mm. means, for example, Abit is, is, is your audience and this is what he'll be watching and that what, what point of time he'll be at home and what kind of show he'll be liking so i think that's that you you're just giving a, a structure to your audience rather than so my next question is that you were involved with one of the biggest reality shows in malaysia and till date i think malaysia has ever seen academy fantasia that was huge that was big and and we are not talking about the era where we have social media we have you know, such great response, straight away, instant mm-hmm. stuff happening. He had at 15 to get comments from the audience. We had blogs. What was that era and how did you maneuver that bigger show, which, uh, you know, changed the, the, the pers- uh, television history, I would say? That, um, you know, sometimes in life you're fortunate to, you know, be involved in or uh, to, to yeah to be involved in something groundbreaking like that and I was fortunate enough fortunate enough to be with Academy Fantasia um, and that was again fitting a specific brief because um, that was very early uh, in me taking over the job at content and the brief was to find good shows so that we can bring uh, more subscribers and um, when I um, met the content team back then I said what's the biggest show that you know we can use to promote and put in our magazine and say that there's a reason for you to watch Astro and this because of this show and I was told it's Roda Impian Wheel of Fortune which is a damn good game game show but not 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 signature that you know people would flock around and and, and watch right so I said ah okay we have a problem so at that time um, we, there was no be- benchmark there was no you know uh, something which you could follow because no, the- no, nothing. You're right. Absolutely right. But that time, uh, the trends were there because you must remember this was early 2000s. So reality shows started um, uh, becoming huge globally um, with Big Brother and uh, Pop Idol, which then became American Idol and other idols. So at that time, I wanted to find entertainment show. I really wanted to find an entertainment show because we know Malaysians love entertainment, love singing competitions and love their dramas and so on. And uh, I was offered a few choices. In fact, at that time, uh, I actually looked at Idol first. Uh, we, we spoke to Fremantle and said, oh, okay, uh, this is interesting enough. And then the Mexicans came later and, you know, we picked up uh, Academia, which we then translated to Academy Fantasia. That was basically uh, a risk. I, I, I will not <laughs> describe it any other way. No, because that, that show didn't do well in other countries. No, you're right. Yeah, in other, in other territories, it was okay. Um, I think in his homeland, Mexico, it was okay. But we were taking a risk. And at that point, I had Idol or Lacademia. And I chose Lacademia for a very specific reason. Um, and that was the strategic part of our decision. And that was the camaraderie and the community angle of Academia, I thought would be more resonant with Malaysia compared to the idol format, which was a bit more individualistic. And it's about this individual singer, solo singer, singing and winning and all that. Whereas Academia or Academia Fantasia was about 
the friendship and you know them helping each other and so on. So we chose that. But how how it became the phenomenon that it was was partly our doing, but I think it was also the audience, you know, just lapping it up and saying that, my God, this is just something that we have not seen before. Um, I remember, I think, um, I think I can't remember, I think it was week two or week three. Um, I was uh, driving to the office, I parked my car and I was walking towards the main lobby. And as I walked through the main lobby, I was trying to get a coffee at the cafeteria. The guard chased after me. He ran towards me. <laughs> He said, Encik Zaini, Encik Zaini. I said, oh, what's wrong? <laughs> what did I do? And he said, no, Encik, this program last night, it's really, really good because you know everybody's talking about it and the, the family was talking about it, my neighbor's talking about it. That's when I knew that, you know... It, We've got a hit. we got a hit because there was no rating and Astro never subscribed to any rating system or, or on, on any rating system. So it was just a hunch. You know, it was just a hunch and it was basically based on uh, the feedback that we got from various people. But when you get that kind of validation from real people, you know, yeah. not just your colleagues. Your colleagues are not real people. You know, they, they live in a bubble and you know, they're all in their urban household sort of mindset, right? Um, then you know it resonates well with the audience. No, but you, 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 you nailed the answer there. And think about it if that's made today with all the social media, with all analytics, with all ratings, with all, you know, uh, checks and balances which which uh, platforms do. Do you think uh, you will get the same kind of response, the same kind of you know uh, authenticity in a show like Academy Fantasia? No, that's a tough question. I don't know. I don't know. I think I my answer would come from at least two perspectives. Number one, I was at I was there at a the time when we were uh, taking big swings. We were just swinging it, you know, and then we took risks and we gambled a bit and uh, we got some hits, but we also had a lot of failures. Um, I'm not sure that in this current, uh, in the current time when people are very, you know, cost conscious and so on, a show like that would have been greenlit. I don't know, number one, from the maker's perspective, right? Um, as an impact to the audience, I also don't know. I think today when we are so sensitive and we are so reactive to what people say and how people react online and elsewhere, um, you have no choice but to either comply, abide or adjust. Um, and that would somehow dilute. You know, the, It will become more clinical. It will, it will be more clinical and it would be you know, uh, not so authentic because a lot of the attraction was the rawness. rawness, innocence of the participants, right? And our own, you know, uh, from the production perspective and from, from the maker's perspective, our own ignorance and our own rawness and our own ability to just say, try this and try that, it doesn't work. I remember every Tuesday we would sit down and plan the concert on Saturday and it was basically in my room. We look at the set list and, you know, wow. this song and that song, this song and that song and then all the surprises would come and so on. And it was just the four or five of us, you know. So today, I don't know whether that could still be done. I'm sure, you know, that would need a committee yeah. to approve, you know. So it's different. You lose all, all the, you know, uh, uh, the, the the rawness, the the immediate, you know, reactions. I think uh, with so many data points and so many touch points, you, you pretty much lose that, uh, you know, spontaneity uh, in a show. And you don't know nowadays with uh, cancel culture and being woke and so on, a show like this is, is just hitting hitting it hot yeah. with a lot of different types of, uh, of viewers and audience. So I don't know. I was just lucky. Well, you were actually, we all were, I mean, part of it at, at one point of time. I think pretty much whoever was, uh, you know, uh, involved in broadcast media at some point of time were, were touched by the show. So, yeah, I, I completely, you know, we, we were all very lucky to, to be some way or the other part of this big show. Uh, coming to these three channels which were, were, which were brought in under your purview, uh, one was the 24-7 news channel, Awani. The other one was the Islamic channel, Oasis. And the KISS channel, Cheria, which I was also a part of in all three of them. What was the strategy behind it for bringing these three very key channels for Astro? 
I mean, you're asking all these questions from 24 years ago, you know, 20 years but ago. But it, it, it is still effective. It's still, you know. Yeah, but I may not remember. <laughs> you're not that old. <laughs> okay. All right. And so uh, at that time, we had a regional vision. Uh, we had an office. Uh, we had a, a relationship in Indonesia, uh, which we, uh, which meant that we wanted to, you know, we had a proper content strategy there with channels and and and. and Uh, original shows and so on. So, uh, out of that vision came uh, a series of niche channels, um, and it, it, you can imagine that the thinking was very, very uh, simple. Uh, if I can just simplify it, um, one was um, the highest rating uh, uh, content in in Malaysian landscape is Bulletin Utama. Was um, I don't know what it is now, but it was Bulletin Utama. So that's number one fact you know what's the insight from there people want their news so then came the idea of what if you know we just have our news channel to offer something throughout the day keeping relations updated um, as, as they keep going um, oasis was coming from the idea that you know with a growing malay subscriber base surely it's not one generic definition of a Malay man or, or a Malay woman or a Malay family, right? Uh, some are coming from slightly different psychographic uh, backgrounds. Um, uh, some more urban, some more rural. And we started splitting the consumer segments. And we said that, okay, the urban ones would try and go with um, sort of, you know, certain content strategy. Whereas uh, another type, what if we offer something a bit more uh, uh, Islamic, religious and spiritual? Um, and the kids one, I think it was just a spin-off because we we tested a few things on our mainstream channel uh, with some kids show and that tested very well, that did very, very well. And we said that, hey, you know, if the international guys like Disney's and Cartoon Network could survive and could do very, very well with dedicated kids channels, why can't we have our own local kids channel? So that's how it started. Very, very simple strategy, but uh, backed by... Um, Understanding of where the gaps are, where the holes are uh, with the consumer segments and then us coming in and offering, uh, uh, you know, uh, a certain product category. So how did you balance, you know, creating uh, these kind of content, uh, which has the mass appeal uh, along with competing with free to air channels? That's a good question. Um, I think it's more about, I think there was always a differentiation between Uh, what we want, what we wanted to be as a business versus free to wear, um, it was very clear, uh, very early that we were a premium business because we were subscription based, and therefore we would have to offer something different, versus what you would be able to find on your normal free to wear channels. Um, so the um, split of uh, or the introduction of the niche channels like our new Oasis and Cheria, for example, is one strategy. But our bread and butter, like Academy of Fantasia, Raja Lawak, um, and other shows, um, we had to compete with uh, the free to air guys, right? I remember, and this was very early on, when I took the job, um, the answer was, when I got the answer, Roda Impian, right? So the, the thought that, that we all had was, then what do we offer the, the viewers, the Astro viewers? Um, and Astro being Astro, you know, my hunch and my intuition alone would not be enough. So we had to back it with um, research. So we <laughs> commissioned massive focus groups, you know, going up to the north, to the east and Borneo, Sabah, Sarawak, urban, rural. We had, you know, multiple dozens of groups um, and we were listening through the one-way mirror, what the Machis were saying about, you know, what they want to watch. The, the, the question was, what would you like Astro to offer you so that you can pay the 90 ringgit, the 100 ringgit, the 60 ringgit a month? What would it take for you to subscribe to Astro? And they were saying, you know, we watch a lot of Chiraka Rama, we watch, watch a lot of Akasya and all this drama, very, very successful drama slots on TV3. And then they talked about something else. But after, I can't remember, I think it was two months, the agency gave, you know, a two-hour presentation and, you know, the conclusion was they want drama. Which to me was not a surprise because if you look at the the top rating shows in Malaysia, they were always dramas, right? So uh, so then I, I thought, 
Hmm. So we the answer is the answer. Do we give them more drama? Isn't that a proliferation of the same content, right? Okay, you can make your drama more expensive, more shiny, more glossy, whatever, but it's still drama, right? So I I I was bothered with that uh, conclusion, uh, and I didn't have an answer to that. But if you think about what we did, when Academy Fantasia became uh, hugely popular, uh, I had to face the press every week. After every concert, yeah. I had to pr- uh, face the reporters. They w- they would you know line up in front of me like a firing squad, and they would say, Ah, this kid did not seem well. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this costume was. Uh, you atrocious. became the judge behind the scene. <laughs> I know, I, I, commenting all sorts of things about the show, about the concert, and then I remember there was one week when one reporter asked me. Uh, so he said, he said, Encik Zaini, uh, this particular pelajar, uh, student, uh, he doesn't sing very well, does he? <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. I can't remember the exact question, but I remember the context. So he said, he doesn't sing very well. He's not a good singer, something like that. So then I gave, a, I gave an answer. I can't remember what I answered, but I gave a politically correct answer. I gave the appropriate answer, you know. Um, but in my mind, I said, ah, but you don't get it. Academy of Fantasia, Academy of Fantasia is not about singing. It's a drama. Uh, yeah. So coming back to what I said earlier about consumer research, so Academy of Fantasia was uh, a solution offered not to a direct question. Because if people wanted drama, I always say that sometimes, most, most of the times, people don't know what they don't know. Right? So if all you're used to is drama, you don't know what else can actually excite you can make you cry, right? So in coming up with a solution, sometimes it's never a good approach to basically just look at what's in front of you. You just have to have a peripheral vision and make sure that you are able to look at all angles. Yeah, that's a great answer. That's that. I think that I agree with you on that one. So from Astro, you moved on to ID8 Media, which is now revolutionary, uh, Revolution Media. What was your thought process at that point in time? What do you wanted to build? What was the strategy? And uh, how did it all start? Uh, I wanted to start a shop. Well, at that point in my career, I had two choices. To keep going um, in the corporate world or to venture out on my own and find my own niche. Um, And the thinking was, um, can we do something that sets us uh, apart from the common playing field in a way that our products can actually have uh, international appeal. That was, that was basically the, the, uh, the gem of an idea. And I was fortunate enough that we had uh, investors and that supported our initial vision. Um, and the idea was to find IPs that we could uh, develop, uh, adapt, um, uh, w- that would attract um, international interest. Um, so we had um, various books, uh, materials that we, we acquired options to um, that we adapted into uh, film format as well as series format. Um, fast forward to now, um, I realized that you know uh, a vision has to evolve. And uh, now we deal with both our own original IP as well as working to work with other international producers to, um, who wants to come and shoot their shows in Malaysia. So my business has somewhat evolved um, where we do both the scripted stuff, our own series and films, our own IP as well as um, working with other platforms as well as doing servicing jobs for international studios, um, which you know, which is satisfying because you are really selling Malaysia. Yep. You're basically uh, saying, hey, come to Malaysia. We have beautiful locations and uh, uh, international level crew. And we have the Malaysian government that is extremely supportive uh, by giving the rebate, um, which is a huge uh, uh, sell uh, for international shows. So that's where we are. Um, we still want to tell stories, um, but um, I have to balance between both. Oh, well, but you're doing a... Pr- uh, you know, fantastic job where, where you know balancing both scripted and non-scripted uh, shows which you you guys are producing. Uh, with your experience in, in distribution and syndication, what opportunities you see in overseas market for Malaysian content? That's a tough one because we always uh, you know we always talk about what kind of content should Malaysians create that will travel internationally, um, and I think. 
because I'm an engineer, so I always look at data points, right? So if you look at all the data points of firms that have made it out there, I don't know whether you can call it a trend or whether there are specific patterns um, for you to say that this is the, the, the formula, this is the right amount of soya sauce to put in this product, right? Well, I mean, judging by this year alone, uh, Abang Adik and Tiger Stripes and samples like that would then question uh, what kind of content we should create. From my perspective, um, I'm, I'm coming from a very commercial perspective. So it's always about, ideally it's a situation where at development stage, at the creative stage, we actually uh, get an interest from potential partners internationally. And then they would come in and say that, ah, we like what you're doing. Um, and I think if you are able to deliver, then we can come in and commit a certain number, you know, either equity or, you know, uh, from a disp- distribution perspective. That then forms our financing. That then forms uh, our stack of various lines that we need to have to get to 100% of financing. So, but to do that, you need to make sure that your, your script or screenplay is uh, interesting enough uh, for them to say, yes, I think we can sell this in South America or we can sell this in Europe. What is that interesting enough element is the million dollar question. Yeah. So that can come from the writing itself. That can come from the talent attachment, be it the director, the, the, the actors or other kinds of talent like producer even. Um, that can come from the settings. You know, the settings is... Uh, unique enough that people would say that ah, this is uh, looking very exotic or whatever. So I think that's the struggle. The, the, the difficulty is offering that element or elements for the international guys to say, yes, uh, it's good enough for me. Uh, we'll work with you on this one. But you do that at the start. You don't do that at the end because at the end, your product is done. You know, so, uh, and that works for certain types of um, films or series. But for the stuff that I'm doing, I, I can't afford uh, to do it that way because at the end, because I depend on certain assumptions, right? Uh, 30% of my ROI will come from whatever, international distribution. But if those guys uh, upon watching the previous, they say, oh, no, I don't know about this, look warm, then I'm buggered, you know? And then then where who's going to pick up the, 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 the percentage that's meant to come from international? So I do it like that. The process is at the very early stage, at development stage, we start sharing and we say, is this interesting enough for you? If not, then what would it make? Uh, how, what, what could we do to make it interesting or appealing for you? So now going to the IP adaptation. Means, uh, I've seen all the stuff which you guys produced from an adaptation po- point of view, whether it was Tombiru, whether it was Mandatory or uh, Ghost Bride and Doug Gently. How do you procure that kind of IPs and how what, how do you produce it uh, after you, I mean, how you develop it after you procure uh, this amazing IPs which you have done in the past? Um to begin with, you, you, you yourself or personally, I, I have to have an interest in the IP. Um, you must like it. I mean, this, what we do is so painful, right? <laughs> but, not, but not everybody uh, has been that fortunate enough to like the IP and get the IP to produce it for, t- sure, for, sure, for, for sure. screen. Then, then, then my all salesman skills uh, will come <laughs> handy, right? No, because first, I must like the material. Ah, okay, this, this is interesting enough. I... I worked with uh, an extremely, extremely talented author, Ramli Awang Murshid, Sabahan, good friend of ours. And he's got like 40 books under his belt, extremely successful. He's with Karan Krab. So we worked with him for uh, On Tumiro and Mandatory. Um, there's something about his writing. Uh, he creates all these characters that have a certain aspiration and he writes it in a certain linguistic manner that is uh, very, very appealing. So that's that part. And we, we, we sort of say, ah, okay, there's a few characters and a few stories that we can, we can grow from here. With The Ghost Bride, um, we looked at it a long time ago. We, we picked up the book and we said, ah, this is nice. This is, you know, the author is Malaysian. She's living elsewhere now, but author is Malaysian and a story about, you know, this little girl in Old Malacca. Uh, what's not to like, right? And it's straddling between current world and the underworld or the other world. Um, and we chased after it. I actually got to a very advanced stage of wanting to acquire the, the IP. And then coming back to what I said just now, I was not able to secure a buyer. 
And to do that serious, it would need serious money. Yep. And it would need serious investment from serious people. Um, I would not be able to find it locally. So I had to depend on the big boys from um, from out there to support it. Um, so I left it. Um, disappointingly, I had to I had to leave it. And then fast forward, <laughs> Netflix came about. They launched their regional uh, office in Singapore and they wanted to have big visions in Asia and uh, received a phone call from my friend uh, Erica and she said, uh, we have this IP that we'd like to, uh, we'd like to do um, and we're thinking of doing it with you. Um, would you be keen? So I said, sure. Which one? The Ghost Bride. So I... <laughs> It was meant for you, Zainab. Yeah, it was yeah. meant for you. There's another one, actually. There's another one that we are hoping to shoot later this year. Again, uh, an extremely talented author in the uh, uh, young adult, middle grade uh, sort of segment. Uh, her book is published internationally. And um, I looked at it a long time ago. I was a fan of this author. And we went all the way to the Asian in, in New York. Um, had to abandon it. And then, um, fast forward, a platform... Uh, um, uh, call me later another big platform called me later and say Zane we got something that we think we want to do with you I said which one and he mentioned the book I can't mention the book now but he said this book so again you know it's a similar thing to the ghost bride um, so you must like the IP you must like the IP first and foremost and then the job is to sell right so with this author I had to sit down with her at Starbucks um, in uh, where was it uh, at the Curve multiple times and I said this is how we want to do it this is I think how we can actually package it this is how I think we should who we should do it with I had to sell it I had to convince the author that yeah I'm giving my baby to the right yeah. bloke otherwise you're going to bastardize it and it becomes something yep. that uh, I think that's that's one of the main concerns the, the the authors have where they will which anybody else will not be as close or as you know, as emotional to their material. No, and, and that's, we've done a lot of adaptations and that's extremely difficult. I remember working with Ramli. So Ramli's books are typically 500, 600 pages, you know. Wow. You know, so they're not your... Um, your, your Weekend your, reading your, book. Yeah, your Mills and Bone, right? Yeah. It's 600 pages. So uh, how do you turn that into a 90-page screenplay? So we struggled with that. So it took a long time for me uh, and my team to convince Ramli that, okay, we have to get rid of half the book. <laughs> it's only 300 pages and see whether we can whittle it down to something that's really con- concise and, you know, uh, bite-sized that the audience in a two-hour movie or 90-minute movie could stomach. Um, but if you can't convince the author, you, 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 you're gone. You, you, don't have, uh, you don't have anywhere to go because the rights would not be given to you. Yeah, that's that's quite an insight, actually. So, what challenges do you face in finding strong projects, you know, uh, and also strong project partners uh, who can see your vision, who can see this whole big picture which you have for international partnerships, and you know, you know, and while creating that content. Like-minded people is an ideal situation. Uh, that's that's a dream for many um, because as I say, what we do is tough. It's really uh, long hours and it's you know lots of arguments and lots of debates and lots of cold wars uh, with your partners and parties and so on, various parties. So you must ideally you must work with people that you like working with, um, and that cuts across all the different aspects of what we do, right? Uh, in production, working with talent and working with directors and writers and so on. But it's also relevant for finding partners like investors and studios and people like that. So, uh, and, and that's tough because uh, you can't be choosy. You still want to get your product made, your film made. Then, you know, beggars can't be choosers. But I think that's a way that you're able to uh, steer your way that you only... Uh, you you find you, you you position yourself such that people want to work with you, which is half the battle. Because I always find that, like in my unscripted business, so we do we do um, international shows for Australia, the US. We're trying to see whether we can bring uh, this big show from the UK to to shoot middle of this year, and I realize that actually it's not about Malaysia locations and beautiful beaches and you know mountains and our our landscape it's partly that it's actually more about them 
knowing that they have a safe pair of hands who will deliver to work with in this godforsaken place that we've never been to um it's actually that it's the their confidence in you and 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 i think that's a lot that that's what a lot of people don't see because i i have a lot of friends who keep wanting to promote locations and so i said yeah locations is one but vietnam has beautiful beaches thailand has beautiful beaches and then you know there are active volcanoes in indonesia right so malaysia is not unique in that way we have many other unique uh, appealing elements that we can use to promote but actually it comes down to the people they need they want to you need to make sure that they see something in you and they want to work with you because without that then you know uh, it's going to be very very painful so i think that's that that's been my mantra and that's been the way that we try and nurture our relationships and make sure that they're confident and again what a lot of people don't see is um the strength in what we offer is both what you see and what you don't see because people see locations and people see actors and people see uh, you know visible things that are common uh, common to a lot of people what people don't see is the plumbing part and the plumbing is uh, is what makes or breaks the company you know is the contracting is the accounts is the way that we manage the reports the way that we report the cash flow and so on um uh that can be a secret sauce because without that solid foundation everything else is fluff because yeah. you know it can just easily crumble if if the bottom parts are not solid the base has to be really really strong yeah not much has been talked about dirk gently which i thought was an amazing series uh so how was it to develop that series and produce that series uh, which i don't think uh, not many people know about connections are Uh, are, are necessary in in a, in a situation like that. So Dirk Gently is a character in IP created by Douglas Adams, uh, mostly known for um, Hitchhiker's Guide. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And my partner uh, Arvin, who um, who basically managed our office in LA, uh, had a connection with Douglas Adams way back when he was still a student. Uh, so fast forward when we decided to get into business together um he said i think you know we have a we have a shot uh, at trying to do this because the ip somehow was released from uh, somebody holding on to it so it was available so we went for it and because of his earlier connection um it was door half opened so i think that's how it was possible to begin with then it was a question about it was a question of um how to gather the the team so we got a show runner and then we've pitched it to studios and you know um uh, th- because it's an american show and we did it for bbc america and netflix uh, us it needed um really really serious money and really serious partnerships and we would like you to- had frodo in the show we had frodo in the show <laughs> and uh, uh, that was fun um but um but yeah uh, we had a major studio working with us uh but we we were it was fun because we were able to control the creative it was our show we wrote uh the materials and you know all the selections were done collaboratively um but i think if you want to go into that world uh, you can't not be in that world so that's how that was possible because we were in the community we had people on the ground that were you know having coffees and spending the hours with the various people in LA um a kind of difficult to do it remotely from here it, it would just be impossible i mean you could have outliers that could still break into it but as a business uh, sustainable you know um, i i think you have to have your people on the ground so if you look at from, from Doug Gently's adaptation and then you look at uh, uh, the ghost brides adaptation what was the difference between the two adaptations uh, and your approach towards it i think it, it was it was basically um appealing to a much a much wider audience um global audience because as i said we we made it for bbc american netflix so we needed the right attachment so so coming back to packaging right so we had um elijah wood as as the lead and we had named uh, people uh, in the creative side on the creative side um so that by itself was attractive enough to the commissioners bbc america and netflix 
But with the Ghost Bride, it was a different uh, ambition. It was basically finding an Asian IP that could resonate globally. And uh, we chose uh, an IP that was uh, based on a period story. That's number one. Uh, and we wanted to tell the story in a language that uh, would allow for us to penetrate certain audience, and we chose Mandarin. Um, so it was coming from a slightly different perspective. It was, uh, and that was done for Netflix, their Singapore office. And they wanted a, a series of shows that they commissioned as originals uh, to resonate among different pockets. And they wanted the Ghost Bride to be used as uh, this extremely unique Asian IP to penetrate the Chinese audience globally, as well as the mainstream international audience. You know, yesterday was, uh, the, I think, the third anniversary, or fourth anniversary of the Ghost Bride's premiere. It showed How on do my, you remember on, all these things? Because it came remember. on my Facebook. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was a great, uh, you know, collaborating with your team uh, on that project. Oh, yes, was, yes. You thank you so much that. for having of us course. for a, a small part in that show. Um, but going back to your, 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 you know, how do you identify and procure this kind of, uh, you know, material for producing a TV show? Read. Read. You have to. You have to expose yourself to materials. You you have absolutely no way of avoiding that. I remember during COVID, um, we, we did an exercise and it was very interesting because me and my team, obviously, I had, I, I decided to sustain the team, meaning to keep the team during COVID time. So then we went through this exercise. Um, I gave them a brief and I was involved in that exercise as well. I said, I said, let's read all these books and I had a specific set of books. And then every week we would sit together and pitch three ideas from this book. And it was basically a, 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 a books of short stories. So there was, uh, I think it was five of us. We just read. You know, we finish, like, I fin personally finish one book a week, which I would never do. You know, and from 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 finished, uh, from finished finishing one book that had, I can't remember now, 15 short stories, then, you know, we picked two or three. The point is, if you're not exposed to materials, how are you going to find ideas? You, I'm not Tarantino, so not a lot of us are Tarantino, uh, where we are able to, you know, find that unique idea crazy enough to wow the studio execs, right? Mortals like us, we have to struggle. Mortals like us, we have to work hard. And I find that uh, a lot of what we do is because we expose ourselves to a lot of good materials. Yep. And then navigate yourself. Because knowing good materials is one thing, navigating for you to basically get to it and have a hand on it is obviously a different science altogether. So is it a significant challenge that uh, for the Malaysian creative industry to find these kind of material to adapt in, for, 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 for screen? Somewhat, I think somewhat, somewhat difficult, not, not difficult, but challenging, can be challenging because you must understand that um, in the publishing world, a lot of what's available, or a lot of what's published in Malaysia are uh, fulfilling the mainstream appeal, logically and naturally. And therefore, you will find that of the top 20, 18, 19 are romantic novels. Okay, one or two um you know, quirky ones from Ramli Awang Murshid, mm. and then one or two are from our good friends at Fixie, right? But the rest is basically fulfilling that, you know, mold, you know? So if you, if you use that as your only source, then you are influenced by only romantic stories. So, so that's one. The other one is for us to look at other materials elsewhere and we should all do this, you know, uh, go to Webtoons and try and find something there. Uh, go and read uh, some other short stories from other markets. Um, if you like them, uh, make the effort to reach out to the publisher or the author and say that I'm interested. And some of them might be flattered. Oh, okay. Is Malaysian producer called Creatives 2, you know, interested in our book? Hey, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, let's, let's hear what you have to say, right? Um, but it can be challenging because, um, you have a mismatch between what the materials, what the material offers, and what you want to do as a creator, as, either as a producer, writer, or director, uh, and somehow you have to find a, a balance in between. So, 
going to the entrepreneurial journey you had from building a company from scratch how was uh, means excitement level aside what were the challenges and what were the rewards of 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 starting you know revolution media uh very very deeply satisfying uh, is what i can say i mean i had a good run at astro i i had a, a decent um stint over there i had good mentors i worked with talented people um i also worked with you uh, please be specific <laughs> i might uh, you know uh, counted in the you know talented or just worked with me there, there was a pause there uh, <laughs> um but i i decided that you know i want to be in the trenches because you know it's all about doing things with your hands right um so i think i made that call very early on um and then and then it's been a struggle even until today we've been in business for 11 years now uh, and we still struggle i mean last year was good i think this is going to be hopefully inshallah it's going to be awesome um but it's been a struggle and the issue that the challenge has always been sometimes you're alone you're by yourself yep. you know there's 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 no person that you can talk to i mean the the have always been supportive people around me but sometimes when you talk to them they can offer advice and they can offer insights and they can offer chit chat and have coffee with them but at the end of it you you by yourself yeah. okay so if you don't move things don't move yeah. you know if you don't anticipate things might fall apart right uh so that has always been the struggle and i think uh, anybody who wants to consider this uh career option i strongly recommend it i strongly recommend it because it's very fulfilling um is hard work but be prepared mentally because uh it can be very overwhelming get 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 a box of Xanax get a box of Xanax <laughs> lots of Kleenex and all the access <laughs> so uh, you know uh, what necessary steps means i'm i'm, I'm really happy how how Re- revolution media because i've seen revolution media starting off and and now how it has grown and it's just like now a uh, uh, international company where we are working with such great uh, you know partners around the world but what are the necessary steps you know to raise the bar for malaysian content globally um we talked about content just now in terms of choosing the right content materials so that you know there's interest internationally but i think there's also an argument about malaysian production so that we are seen as good as anywhere anywhere else um uh, to do production we're trying to bring a show here um and this show was shot in south africa uh, for the first season and second season they are trying to look for another location and i think they were really uh, ready and content to go to south africa for the second season so we just got in just in time to open the door just to be and say just hold on <laughs> you know look, look this side look this side it's a bit further to the left but um we started talking and now they're coming down and you know we're doing recce and you know we are doing budgets and and, and so on that half uh, is what a lot of people don't see the, the the half where you really really have to sell yourself malaysia our locations and destination and our ability to deliver that is um harder to me uh than any other aspect of what we do uh i was fortunate enough because we did uh, a few shows last year and we were just coming out of covid and um i remember uh, i had a call i had received a call from someone that i used to work with a long time ago and he said he's a, he's uh, he's um uh, he's australian well he's he's irish but he's been living in australia for a long time So he said mate I have this little show and I'm thinking of you know either going to Fiji or shooting it in Queensland but you know uh, I'm thinking of Malaysia can you help me you know go to places so that we can have a look at a couple of islands so I arranged for that you know I, we went to Langkawi and Redang and uh, Perintian and to cut a long story short it then became a behemoth of a show a giant and monster show such a big show it was like a military operation from that show the company that um uh, was commissioning the show it was um a company in australia that was part of another global company they then said hey uh we got two shows coming up uh middle of the year can you help us um shoot it and you know, produce it i said you know it took me half a 
millisecond and said, yeah, uh, let's do it. So we did the Amazing Race um, uh, Australia as well. And then I have another show that I can't name, but it's going to be on a major network uh, in the US. And that all came from the confidence from the first show. Yep. Okay, so fast forward to now, I have a show now that um, came to us from a major studio and we were recommended by a lighting person in our first show. Wow. So this lighting person, whom I met only a few times um, um, in Langkawi, and he said, you guys should speak to those dudes at Revolution. That's how it came about. That's 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 basic. And from there, you know, it, ran out, it became something else and then now we're doing a few things. But I can't stress enough the fact that uh, I was fortunate enough to have an initial connection, but your ability to just grow from there and make sure that you capitalize on the strong relationships that you have, um, you have to deliver. There's no shortcuts. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. You still have to deliver. And hopefully a combination of both your connection and your good delivery is that business card. And that tells everyone that, you know, these guys are the real thing. You know, these guys are solid and you can, you can, give, you can leave your wallet with these guys. Yeah, that's a, that's a great insight. So, I mean, you talked about a lot of shows at this point in time. So, how is Revolution Media slate looking for 2024? Um, we're currently shooting a, a show, a series for a local streamer. I'm hoping that, uh, and then we are shooting um, a, a, an Australian film in April, hopefully. And I'm hoping that we can do um, this uh, big reality show um, middle of the year. I think if all goes well, you know, we'll do a combination of both our own original IP and the servicing part. The servicing part is coming in quite hot and heavy, and I really have to pay attention to it because it's this is you know you're looking after people's money, right? Yeah. It's always the case you're always looking after people's money, but after all the selling and promoting, and they've shifted their decision from going to South Africa to Malaysia. Um, you have to have your full attention and making sure... And you have to make it worthwhile. You can't disappoint them. Yeah. So I think that side of the business is doing okay. Uh, I regret that um, our own IP is neglected. Uh, And that's just management bandwidth. You know, my own capacity to be able to to deal with that. But I think with my team, you know, I've got a a strong um, core team. Um, And this year is probably the year that we are able to expand and, and, and say that we can deal with multiple shows and we can deal with overlapping um, pipeline. Um, so I'm hoping that, because we've got one IP that we've been wanting to do of, uh, for a few years now. Again, it's based on a local book, uh, author that I, I like very much. Um, we've got the material and we're lining up the financing. If all goes well, we hope to shoot it by end of the year. And I think the landscape in Malaysia has uh, been proven that, you know, the audience is there. They are willing to come out, but you need to give them the right product. Having said that, I mean, uh, congratulations for all these great shows that you, you're uh, in the pipeline and you're producing. It brings me to another question, which is a very, uh, de- right now, it's a hotly debated, uh, debated question, is that do we have enough talents in Malaysia to to deliver that quality, that level of quality to international broadcasters? That's uh, a real uh, a real situation. I, I can say that. Um, I think we can deal with a few overlapping shows, but we can't deal with too many. You know, I think Thailand is one market that can deal with a dozen overlapping shows because they've got the depth of the talent pool. I don't think we're there yet. Like, my... My friend who um, at Biscuit, who normally does all the big budget Hollywood stuff, if one of those comes through, then that's it. The talent pool is wiped out, you know. Um, so uh, where do you find your DOP and where do you find your PMs and your line producers and so on? It is a real situation. So our view is this. Um, out of necessity, we had to work with, we had to expand our core circle and we worked with are newer faces and we work with a younger talent and I think in that situation uh, we were able to spot some you know rough diamonds and we were able to get them to be part of a exciting project and then they delivered but also allowed for us to then 
try more and say it will give you more responsibilities. Some of them have not been exposed to international standards of uh, producing, but that's where we come in. And we say that, you know, there's a bit of handholding and, you know, we will look after all your top line stuff and make sure that you don't, you know, fall off the cart. But between what we can offer as guidance and what they can offer as raw talent and raw energy, um, that's the hope. The hope is let's let's bring up the third level and the second level because the top level is gone. Um, production designer for the Ghost Bride, Leslie Yu, is is he's been living can't in Scotland. Can't be seen. Huh? Can't be seen. We tried to reach him a few times. No, no, no. He's uh, not available. He's been in Scotland for how many years now doing which show? That one? Outlander, right? Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, our we have talent. We have very good talent. Uh, but... Not enough. Not enough. And unfortunately, and that's economics, the money out there is just too good for our talent to say no to. Uh, so you can't blame them and you never stop their risky, right? So let them go. Um, your job is to make sure that you bring up the next bunch of guys. So uh, towards the end of the show, uh, I always ask this question, what are the five great content pieces you watched last year? Oh man, I, I was, didn't you, weren't you listening just now? I was busy producing three shows. I was in the jungle and <laughs> pulling on boats. You can't and... produce until you watch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. No, I, I don't know five, but I remember Imaginer very well. I, I, I want to say that and that was... Actually, let's talk about Imaginor because Imaginor is a great case study because uh, it was not meant to be a hit, but it blew things out of the water um, to the surprise of many. It was done by an extremely group of talented um, team, uh, both behind camera and front of. Um, and there was no marketing. There was no yeah. big studio behind it. Yeah. Can you imagine? So if someone can do the Harvard Business School case study, it should sell very well because that's a great case of uh, just trusting in the uh, authenticity and the strength of the product or yeah. the screenplay. It was written very well. Um, and from there, um, um, it was word of mouth. And you can't claim, you can't claim word of mouth can always support your success because yeah. that's risky. But I remember Academy Fantasia was that too, you know. It was word of mouth. Because we didn't have promotion money. We, our we, first concert was done in a hall of 300 people. That we was didn't it. even have internet at that point. Like pro <laughs> proper internet. That's right. So I think uh, Imaginor is, uh, is a clear standout. And of course, there's, uh, there's other little shows like that cover girl. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> oh, great. So that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you so much, Zaini, for all these great insights and, and lovely you know, uh, strategies and stories which you had to tell us. And thanks so much for taking time out and talking to us on what's doing. Hope to, and best of luck for all the new shows you're working on this year and the next. And hope to see all of them on international platforms soon. I've enjoyed this very much. Thanks a lot, Abit. Thank you so much, Zaini. Thanks a lot. Zaini's story is a testament to the power of vision, innovation and strategic thinking in media and entertainment. His contributions have shaped the landscape of Malaysian media and paved the way for it to shine internationally. I am Abid and this has been What's Stewing. Till we meet next time, keep stewing. Mm -hmm.